Hi, this is Roxy or Nikki Rocks, and you are listening to the Interactive Interview. Hey guys, my name is James Walsh, and you are listening to the Wrestling Epicenter here on YouTube. I want to thank you for finding us. Please do me a favor and click that subscribe button and the notifications bell. If you get the chance on this video, click the like button. If you do, it'll turn blue. Check it out. Also, check out WrestlingEpicenter.com for all this great content available in MP3 format, our online store that'll keep us going free and clear, daily news updates, as well as all the information from the history of professional wrestling you could possibly ever want. Check out WrestlingEpicenter.com online right now. Without any delay, let's get to your interview here on the Wrestling Epicenter. I always told myself if I ever interviewed Roxy, I'd have to play that as the intro. That's a song that I've always liked. So, Welcome Roxy Laveau to the interactive interview right here on Blog Talk Radio and WrestlingEpicenter.com. Roxy, are you with us? I am, and that was a bitchin' song. Wow. <laughs> Never heard that one before, huh? <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to get you an MP3 over the MySpace. You can yeah, use your interest theme. <laughs> oh, I would for sure. That would totally be it. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's great to talk to you. Of course, you're one hot name in the news at the moment, and I guess we can cut straight to the lightning round, and then we'll we'll do more of the chronological thing. But I think a lot of us who really want right away want to know how you feeling after departing from TNA in an unceremonious way just a few weeks ago. Um, actually, uh, I was I, I'm actually I was a little bit shocked by it. I uh, hadn't expected it at all. So um, for that, I, I was a little shocked, but now it's kind of just trying to pick up the pieces and get started over, you know what I mean? Like trying to get my name back out there for independence and wherever else I can go. Excellent, excellent. Now, I guess we'll cut right to it. Um, here's what we've heard, and you know how true the Internet can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything on there is true. You know that, right? Exactly. That's why there's pictures of the Lost in Sean Stitch. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're one step, I, I'd say we're pretty much one step above the Inquirer. So, oh, okay, yeah, that, yeah, that's true, too. Exactly, there you go. So uh, the question I have for you is, let's clean up this mess. Here's what we've heard. We basically heard, well, we've heard that there was an incident with Raka Khan. Is that true? Uh, there was an incident with Raka Khan. Is that, what, like, is that the determining factor in, in what happened? Or? Um, I would hate to think that that was it, but uh, what I was actually told from TNA office was that creative didn't have anything more for my character. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but they, maybe they should fire the writers. <laughs> the writers, you see, it's, you're not having the trouble coming up with anything. It's it's them, so. Yeah, so that's that's basically what I was told. So um, I would hate to think that that was actually the reason, but uh, that's what I had heard directly from TNA. Mm-hmm. So what happened? I mean, like I said, we've heard so many things, and everybody thinks that they have it right. I heard it yes. had something to do with a receipt that she wasn't expecting, and then the reaction to that receipt, and there um, you go. It kind of got a little bit crazy in the ring. We had um, a tag match. There was four different tag teams in the ring at once, plus a manager, plus two managers, and a referee, and a run-in. So there was about a small village in the ring at the time, and uh, things just kind of went awry, and... Both of us kind of got confused and were trying to put things back on track. And so things just got jumbled. And <clears throat> both of us ended up getting hit, at the, like, it, one right after the other. And so uh, it was basically just a misunderstanding. And that stuff happens in wrestling all the time. People end up getting hurt or hit or whatever because, like everybody says, it's wrestling, not ballet. Right, right. And um, in the back, uh, there was, like, a little bit of an, a situation, but it wasn't anything that was, blow, like, how it's been blown out of proportion and everything. Um, by the end of the whole conversation, her and I were fine, and we ended up hugging and just being cool with everything. And I saw her for the next couple of days while I was down at TV, and it wasn't a problem. So um, what everybody built it up to be isn't like me and her have this ginormous feud or anything like that. Like if I saw her today, we would just be fine, and there wouldn't be a problem at all. Hmm. That's, so that's interesting because everybody on the Internet thinks they have it figured out, and they think that's <laughs> the end all be all of it all. Yeah, everybody thinks like there's this big fight that happened in the middle of the back, and 
that's not what happened. So <laughs> I'm just like, oh, well, you know, I'm really one of those confrontational people that I'm just going to walk up and start cutting a promo on somebody. Like, it's not the person that I am. It's not the person you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, like, if you if you have seen, like, any of my other stuff with the hardcore stuff, like, I've been busted open at least three times in a TNA ring, and um, I'd never been upset with any of the other girls. Like, it's, mistakes happen. That's what happens in wrestling. Now, going back to that hardcore style, that's something I wanted to ask, wanted to ask you about. Uh, you obviously ended up getting the name The Hardcore Knockout, and your matches always seemed a lot more rough than a lot of the other girls. <laughs> the, the girls in TNA are very good, for the most part, as far as getting action in the ring, but yours just seemed a little bit more extreme than most. How did you adapt that style, and where did you get it from? Um, I'm kind of, what's weird is I got billed as a hardcore kind of wrestler, and if you ever see my stuff, like, earlier when I wrestled as Nick Rocks and the Independents, I'm actually more of, like, a grappler. Like, I, I have a, a couple different styles that I mix in together where there's, like, if it's a bigger role, I can high fly, I can just grapple, I can brawl if I need to and stuff like that. But I think a lot of it had to do with um, my training with Steve Bradley. He was pretty aggressive in the ring, and he was the one who kind of taught me to be more aggressive and not wrestle like a girl. That's what I was actually told. <laughs> Very cool. So, I mean, like, uh, Nick, uh, sorry, Patrick here used to compare you to the female Mick Foley. Oh, yeah. I, that was, my favorite was actually meeting him. And then he was like, oh, hey, Roxy. And I was like, oh, my God, Mick Foley knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, that was, that was like a great moment for me. I've heard that a lot. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm as crazy as he is. I don't know if I would fall off a cage or anything like that. I don't think that's in my repertoire at all. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, most people well, wouldn't. Know. Short. I saw a ladder match you had with Gail Kim that was pretty, there's some oh, pretty that was, stuff in that, that one. Was, yeah, that was amazing. That was like the first, uh, I had done some ladder matches on the independents up here in my area for my old trainer, Steve. And uh, I kind of just stole a bunch of stuff that I had done back then, and Gail had a lot of creative stuff as well. So that came out crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as a uh, hard rock fan here, uh, as you probably mm -hmm. tell, tell by the theme song, I noticed the spelling of rocks, and that's kind of the way, you know, a lot of us, you know, I'm more of a classic rock kind of guy. That's kind of the way we used to spell it back in the day. And uh, is, did that have anything to play into the way that you uh, adapted it into your name as a character, or how did that come about? Yeah, I, I like a lot of different music, but I listen to a lot of metal and hardcore and some punk, so I, I really enjoy a lot of that music, and I saw the way that that was right now. It's like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Nikki rocks. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. And obviously, when you went to TNA, they probably wanted to change the name more for the ownership of it. Am I right in assuming that? Um, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Uh, I think uh, they own the majority of the girls' names, so I think that had a lot to do with it. Ah, but they did keep the rocks in there. They kept Roxy. Yes, I was so pumped for that. I was like, okay, good. See, I had something good. <laughs> <laughs> so you had Roxy Laveau when you came in, and uh, you were the voodoo queen, and it was it was pretty cool when it came in. How did you enjoy taking that character and, and coming in with VKM? Um, coming in with VKM was absolutely amazing. Like, those guys combined have more wrestling knowledge than I think I'll ever know. Like, um, being around BG and his like entire family has been in the wrestling business forever, and then being around Kip, who has been wrestling for at least like 20 years, it's amazing to be a part of that. So I was actually really pumped to do it. I was kind of freaking out a little bit that I was going to mess up and trip on my way to the ring or something and look foolish and then have them both scream at me. <laughs> but um, luckily that didn't happen. It ended up really great, and they're both really good friends of mine still. Hmm. Now, uh, you, uh, you, you have the voodoo mob, the voodoo gimmick, and is that like any, a lot of times gimmicks are an extension of who you really are and things like that. I can't imagine that would actually be an extension of who you are, though. Yeah, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I was actually called, it was TNA's idea. And so they called me and said, oh, we have this idea for a gypsy voodoo TV Nick kind of Sonny and Cher type of person and I was like oh my god what the what is that like you have no clue so for me like I went out and had to buy a bunch of clothes and we ended up um I think I did a hair makeup and costume change like five times that day before I debuted to see what they wanted exactly because I don't think that they were absolutely sure what they were looking for at the same time. Mm. I thought maybe they had watched uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and saw that character in there, and maybe they wanted their own version of it. 
I think one person did for sure. I think one person had that in mind because that's what I ended up coming out as. So I was like, okay, whatever you guys want, I'll do it. I just want a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other extreme thing that they did with you is that uh, in the aforementioned ladder match with Gail Kim, they had you lose that match, and then you had your head shaved. Uh, how did that come about, and how did you feel about doing that? Um, I was actually called. I think somebody in the um, creative department had an idea because it was a sacrifice pay-per-view that one of us girls have to do some kind of a sacrifice. And for me, um, they just called and kind of asked me, and I was, sure, why not? It will make me stand out from the other girls, and it will be something to remember me by because everybody remembers Molly Holly for doing it and stuff like that. So I was like, yeah, for sure, let's do it. Mm. Now... Jake Roberts did it down in Mexico, and don't be offended by this question, but he said he did it because they offered him a hell of a lot of money to do it. To do it. Did they offer you any, any special incentive to do it, or was it just to stand out? Um, no, they did offer me incentive, but it wasn't anywhere close to as much as Jake the Snake got, because I actually talked to him, and he was like, hey, I did the same thing, and I got this amount of money. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I wish I got that. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's a, he's a funny guy. He'll tell you the truth about everything he got paid to. It's funny. Yeah, that's what he was doing, and I was like, uh, okay, cool. Thanks for telling me how bad I did. <laughs> yeah, I thought this, though, when, uh, when you had your head shaved, it didn't look bad at all. Oh, thank you. I actually really enjoyed it, and the reason why it started to grow back was I was asked to, because I was shaving it for like three or four months after that. <laughs> it was the easiest haircut I'd ever had in my life. I loved it. Yeah. I think I heard Nick trying to poke his way through. Nick, were you in there? Yeah. Now, kind of after the uh, head shave, and that was kind of the end of the uh, voodoo queen gimmick. Was that? Did you? Were you excited about that? Were you excited kind of get more to be more of the, uh, you know, Roxy kind of gimmick, or did you kind of think they left the voodoo queen thing a little too soon? Um, I had just kind of gotten comfortable with the voodoo queen stuff at that time, so for me it was like kind of a like. I finally got comfortable with one thing and they were jumping to another, but um, I, I can't say, like, I wasn't, against, I wasn't against it and I wasn't, like, totally for it. Like, you know what I mean? I was kind of just, okay, this is what you guys want to do. You're the boss. So it's kind of like working a regular job if somebody tells you, like, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're just like, uh, okay, no problem. I'll do my best. That seems to be a hot topic on the, on the uh, show right now is that a lot of the guys are coming in there and saying, you know, the problem is that some of the young guys, and you're one of the young guys, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of them come in and, they, and they're, they're willing to please to the point that they don't really stand up for themselves as much as they should, and, and sometimes the, the bosses like it when you say, I don't want to do that. And, it's, and Lance Cade's exact line was, at some point you have to say, I'm not just happy to be here. You know, <laughs> kind of yeah. contest that. Do you think that... So maybe they were looking for that from you, or do you think that uh, you know they, they want the girls to be you know laid back and and do what they're told basically? Um, I think it's kind of a mix. I think some of because there's so many people on the creative team. I think some of them enjoy that where you give feedback and say, okay, I'm comfortable with this and I don't want to do this. Where other ones might be more like, well, this is your job and this is our company, so you're going to do what we say. So it's kind of hard to find the happy medium in between that because being like you said, a new guy, you don't exactly know where your boundaries are right away and you don't want to do something to piss somebody off yeah, yeah. so you're kind of like stuck in the middle you're just like uh okay i'll uh see how this goes and if it doesn't go they could maybe just change it now i think nick i was talking over a second ago nick what was you uh what did i kind of interrupt you on there well it's kind of a similar question but it's like you, you kind of mentioned that they decided to move you away from the voodoo queen gimmick just as you were getting comfortable kind of something like that happened a few times where there was some kind of tweaking of your gimmick do you think that happened too often for you where you never really got to establish a, a gimmick when just when you establish what you want to do with the gimmick they were like well okay now you're going to be the hardcore knockout and now you're going to do this and that do you feel like they kind of change things way too often for you um i don't i i can't really say that um i think i, I was just trying to like it's hard to say because you you're never really uh, given like, okay, this is where we're going to go with this and this is where we're going to go with that. It's kind of like, you're just going to do this and we'll figure it out from there kind of thing. So <clears throat> it's kind of hard because sometimes you can do a change and it will go great. Like when I first shaved my head, like the fans were really behind it and stuff like that. Whereas when I started cursing and stuff, a lot of people were like, okay, like really, what are we doing? 
And so it, it's hard. You got to kind of feel it out to see who's going who's going to stand behind it and who's going to be kind of against it. You know. Now, you didn't always participate in a lot of things that the other knockouts did. You know, a lot of the knockouts, they're getting a little more racy as time goes by and things like that. And it's not something that you really did that much of, the the knockout photo shoots. Is that a time when maybe you did stand up for yourself and say, that's not really something I'm comfortable doing, or, or what happened there? Yeah, yeah. I'm not really, like, the kind of... Um, <clears throat> sometimes it might hurt me. Sometimes it gets me more respect. You know, it's kind of like an in-between thing, but... For me, like, I think that you can do, like, a lot of the photos. I think that you can do a lot um, of photos the same way, like, where you don't have as much clothes on, but you can do it a little bit more classier. And I think if I'm going to start ripping my clothes off for pictures, I should get paid a little bit better. <laughs> I just, it's, it's not, like, out my out. I, I'm kind of not, like, the typical girly girl kind of thing. And when I got into wrestling, it wasn't necessarily just to be, like, in the spotlight or anything like that. Like, I got into wrestling because I enjoyed the athletic part of it and the competition and trying to keep up with the guys, and I had trained with all guys, and I could hear the way that they responded to pictures like that or girls acting that way, and that just wasn't something that was for me. Hmm. Now, in no. WWE, they tend to bring in a lot of models uh, to be their wrestlers, and they kind of train them on the fly and stuff, and obviously we already talked about the TNA knockouts doing more and more photo shoots. Do you think that you not doing that aspect of being a, a knockout or a diva or whatever, do you think that that can hinder you? Yeah, like I said at the beginning, like it, sometimes it hurts me, sometimes it's good. Um, I, I don't necessarily mind it. It's just, for me, I'm not, like, if they tell me, like, okay, make a sexy pose, like normally I'm throwing fists or something like that. So for me, it's just not something that comes, like, sec- second nature, whereas somebody who's been a model or somebody who aspired to be at some point, it's a lot easier for them to be like, oh, okay, and know exactly how to pose and how to make themselves look that way. And for me, it's kind of a little bit more of a difficult thing that I need to work on. Like, I I praise those girls for being able to do it because for me, I'm just like, a sexy pose, what the hell is that? (laughs) That's a good point because a lot of the guys that that I know, they always talk about, oh, you know, this one's so hot and that one's so hot, but... You know what? I make this point about Jerry Lawler, and this is my point. We can see that they're attractive. We don't need puppies screaming at the top of their lungs. We, we yeah. notice them anyway. We we kind of got that. So um, yeah, we know they're there. They kind of get bored with them, or they get them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Right. So you mentioned Patrick mentioned WWE, and we were talking before the show, Patrick and I, about things that might be in your future. Now WWE, they brought in Gail Kim. But when you look on the Internet today, they just hired another dancer. It was actually a featured dancer that they hired to train to be a wrestler. Now, as a wrestling fan who grew up watching, you know, Moolah and Sherry Martell and Wendy Richter, again, thinking, here here we are talking about, you know, girls or women that were attractive in their own right. And uh, obviously, you know, didn't, we didn't need to hear every five seconds that they were. We just kind of saw that. Mm-hmm. With the WWE doing what they're doing now, do you think that that's a place where you could, you know, sl- slide in and fit in, or is that because of what they're doing, someplace that you're not as comfortable going to? Um, I actually, um, you, I think that it's a good balance. Do you know what I mean? Like they still have, they have the models that are there, but they also have a handful of the girls that are actually wrestlers and have come up as wrestlers instead of being models. And um, the thing that happens with that is, I think that a lot of the models need when they're looking they need to have somebody that's in the ring that's actually like a wrestler to kind of teach them okay this is what you're supposed to this is what's supposed to happen and stuff like that so i think that you can actually do a really good balance and like something like that i wouldn't mind being a part of because um coming up on the indies around my area i was usually one of the girls that would have a lot of the girls like newer girls first matches like i'd be their first match or something like that so it's something that i'm kind of used to um, so I, I, I think that it's a great balance, and it's something that I could actually totally be a part of. I would love to. Now, are we talking on the main roster, or are we talking more like the trainers? Or, or... Oh, no, I would love to be a part of the roster. Oh, they have some, <laughs> yeah, they have some of the great girls, like especially having Gail there, and Natalia is really good. Natalia and, is phenomenal. Yeah, I um I actually got to do a tour with her in uh, Japan, and she's great, absolutely great. I'm a big fan of her work. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm not sure, so don't quote me on this, but I think she... You guys worked together, didn't you? Um, we actually never had a chance to work really? together. Really? Okay. 
I yeah, I did. I worked with Beth Phoenix. Oh, did you? Okay, very good. She's another yeah. one. I, I could have sworn yeah, she yeah, mentioned she you in our interview, but that was before she went to WWE. But I could be wrong, so I'm not going to quote that anymore. I think we uh, trained in the ring a little bit when we were over in Japan, like together, and uh, that might have been what it was. Like we we got in there beforehand and wrestled around a little bit. Excellent, excellent. I mean, I could see that SCU going there. Now with the WWE, they're going to want more hair. I think though. <laughs> Would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to do that and grow it back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little bit hard to do because your hair only grows so fast. So I'm just like, oh, man. You're kind of bound by your now? hair now. I'm sorry? Uh, how does the hair look now? Um, I, I kind of look like one of those emo kids in a band. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit toward, more towards pink, but it looks also also like an emo kid. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well... We got a, we got a lot of questions here coming in, and uh, but before we get to the, the closing out the questions, can we give you your little psychological exam for the evening? Oh, for sure. Okay, here's basically what we do. It, it, I make it sound worse than it is, mm-hmm. but uh, what it is is word association. Now, what we do is we bounce a name off of you. If you have a one word answer that could sum them up, that's tremendous. If you have a story you want to tell, you know, by all means. Okay. All right. And the first name on the list is probably the freest spirit of the TNA locker room, and I could be wrong about that. ODB. <laughs> ODB is probably the most amazing person that you'll ever meet. Her character is exactly who she is in the back. So um, hanging out with her on a regular basis might be dangerous for your house. <laughs> yes, you see a lot of her, a lot of her pictures with beers in her hands and things. Yeah, that's usually one of our things. At the end of, like, um, when we would do house shows, that would be how we would finish our matches, running out to the fans and hopefully getting some free beer. (laughs) How about Taylor Wilde? Um, Taylor Wilde is actually one of my closest friends. She's, like, um, she's probably, she's my best friend. And uh, she actually, uh, we were, like, joined at the hit the majority of the time that we were at TV. If you were ever looking for her, you would ask me. If you were ever looking for me, you would ask her. Um, she's a hell of a worker, and she's gorgeous at the same time, so I think that she's probably close to the total package. Now, why do you think she gets as much flack as she does? Um, I think because of the way that she was brought into TNA at the fir- at first, um, when it was somebody that uh, all of us had been wrestling with, Austin Kong, and trying to win the title, and none of us could do it, and then somebody just comes off the street and wins it, I think that had a lot to do with it, um, kind of with the fans being like, what the hell is that? But I think that she did great with what she was given, and she works her ass off. She's in almost every match when you look on TV now, so I think that she did really good with what she was given. Absolutely. Uh, Nick, you were going to say something? How about Awesome Kong, someone that you wrestled a few times on TNA? Uh, I, awesome Kong is one of my favorite wrestlers, actually. Um, I love being in the ring with her. Uh, you, if you check out some of the older Shimmer DVDs that the uh, All Girls Independent mm-hmm. Company, Absolutely. Um, there's a couple matches that her and I had had on there. And for me, she's she's absolutely her name. She's completely awesome. She uh, she works hard for you in the ring, and you work just as hard to make sure everything goes great. And it it, it always ends up a great match. Now, Patrick has, uh, early on, he made the call, and I think after what we discussed before we started recording the interview, I would call Awesome Kong this generation's female Vader. Oh, for sure. Um, I don't know if you you guys, I'm sure, um, obviously know Aja, Aja Kong. Aja Kong, yes, yes sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, she reminds me a lot of her, and it's, it, she's so great. I love it. It, it. It's amazing to see her. Like, it's great to see that this generation of girls actually get the monster, and it makes me happy to have that because it shows a lot of the girls that are coming in. You don't have to be, like, cookie-cutter type of thing. You can you can be different, and it's okay. Well, exactly, and I think that's what we need more of. Like I was saying earlier, you know, you had you had the, the tougher ones back in the, uh, in the day, and, I mean, you had such a different array that you could pick your favorite. And personally, my favorites were never... Let me let me put it out there. My favorites were never Tori Wilson and, and Kelly Kelly. I was always more of the, you know, the tomboy, tough girl kind of thing. So I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I think we need to have more variety because not everybody has the same taste. It's like you you go to Dairy Queen. There's not just going to be vanilla or vanilla. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you get some yeah. kind of choice. 
see, like, you're my hero at this point. <laughs> if you can just start being part of the creative team at another company, that'd be amazing. <laughs> exactly. Well, how about uh, two of my favorite personalities in the current TNA knockout division, the current champion, Angelina Love, and her partner, Velvet Sky? Um, Velvet Sky, I have known since, uh, basically since I started, because she started around the same area that I did. So uh, we had been on the indie circuit together for a while, and she is amazing. I love her to death. Um, and Angelina Love, I had just actually met for the first time when she came to TNA, and that was how um, I became close with her. And I think that she's a great, great talent, and she's hot. So, I mean, that's perfect right there, and they're great on the mic, and I think that their characters, they get over really, really, really well. Hmm. I think the best part about them is that when they started to come out of their shell and be these great, uh, really nasty heels, they actually helped you morph into the, the hardcore knockout. So it was like we got three great characters born out of one angle. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of the head shaving angle had a lot to do with helping them propel at the same time. So it was like we all kind of worked off each other, which I thought was great. Exactly. I mean, a year or so ago, maybe a little bit over a year ago, when people would talk about TNA – it was almost like the knockouts had eclipsed everything else that they were talking about regarding that company, almost in the same vein that the X Division did when the company first started. I mean, the knockouts were, for a time, and I hope they get back to that, the the focal point of a lot of the, the casual fans that were just starting to tune into TNA. Yeah, a lot of times there would be like three or four gold batches or segments on the show, and I thought that that was great. Um, it was a chance for us to actually show, like, the general audience that these, that there's girls that are out there that can actually work their ass off and they're willing to do it for you right on TV. And they're not just, like, I, when we had first started the Knockouts Division, everybody was so different and looked so different. Everybody had something different to offer. And I think that's a lot of what was um, making the Knockouts so big. How big of a blow do you think it was? How big of a blow do you think it was when Gail Kim left uh, TNA to the um, I can speak for myself. Like it's hard for me to talk for any of the other girls, mm -hmm. but um, for me, uh, Gail <clears throat> Gail was like my third independent match ever. Um, we wrestled for um, Alpha on his. It was WXW. WXW. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The Elite Eight that we had done, and she was my third wrestling match ever. <laughs> Really? So for me, like, uh, Gail is somebody that's very, like, influential for me where her and Tracy Brooks in the in the back would be people that I would ask advice to and I had a lot of respect for. So when I saw her leave, it was actually kind of hard for me because I was losing somebody that I really looked up to. Now, Pat, I kind of interrupted you there. What were you going to say? Yeah, uh, well, we talked about um, the knockout division kind of eclipsing the, everything else that TNA was doing at the time. Um, how did the male wrestlers feel about that? Did they, was that something that upset them, that you girls seemed to be stealing the show from them for, for a while? Um, actually, a lot of the guys in the back are great, and they're actually really supportive. Like, they would come, and um, some of them would come before the match and make sure that we were all calm and not slipping out, <laughs> because a lot of times that's what will happen. Um, they were always right there at the end when you came out back through the curtains to tell you whether or not what they thought about your match, if there was anything they thought that you could fix or anything. So I don't think I, I never saw any animosity or anything like that from any of the guys. They were always very, very supportive to us. Do you kind of feel like the knockout division got hurt by all the focus that went on the main event mafia front line angle? Because it seemed like, when that started, everything else that was going on more or less was pushed to the side. Mm, I, I'm not quite sure um, if that had like if that would be something that would push what we had aside. I think that um, there's so many girls coming in and trying to fit everybody that's on the roster because TNA has a, a really extensive roster, and I think that trying to fit everybody in on one show is a little bit. Right. Um, of a task for the creative division, the de for the creative department. So I think that that just has a lot to do with it. Right, right. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the interview with with your character. And like I said, you know, your character was one of the ones that I can get into and, and watch because you were something different. You weren't just the, 
you have everything that a woman has to have in terms of appearance, you know what I mean? But you're, you're not a dog, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but I'm just kidding. But, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're not that, but, but you're, you're able to get in there and be tough and, and do things. And I don't know, to me it seems like they should be able to do something with that. But did, did you see a way that they could have uh, gone forward with your character? I mean, obviously you must have. Yeah, like, when, it, when it's your own character, you're always like, well, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Why can't you do this? But right. it was just something the creative department doesn't see um, happening or maybe, like, they just made a bunch, they just hired a bunch of new girls and stuff like that. And it's kind of, I, I guess, it, I, the way that I could see it, like, at, positively is, okay, I was able to be a part of the beginning of it, and now it's time for these girls to have their, you know, Right. Um, that I, I try to be really positive about stuff that happens and the best of everything. So that's that's basically the way that I try to look at it. Well, that's a positive Did they ever talk about putting the title on you? Because it seemed like you were always in the title picture, or at least close to getting it, but you never quite made it. Um, like like I was telling you before, um, you're, I never really knew where anything was really going. So for me, like <laughs> nobody ever was like, hey, you're going to be next or anything like that. So for me, I'm not quite sure if that was ever in an idea to have happen or if it was something that any of the creative team would want. Um, but for me, it was never it was never brought up to me. Like if there was a Bound for Glory match where I was shocked that I was a part of it and I was like, okay, yay, <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, do you think that's a good or a bad thing, the, the fact that a lot of the guys don't know exactly you know where it's going? Because I know a lot of the WWE guys they want to know, you know, what's going to be happening for the next two, three months down the line. At least that's the way it used to be. Do you think not knowing is a good thing or a blessing in disguise, or what do you think? Um, well, it's really great if you like surprises um, <laughs> and you're able to roll with the punches. It's good that way. But it, it's also really worrisome because for me, um, after I was sent home, I was home for two and a half months, and I had no idea what was going on. So for me, like, it, it, it makes you worry and think, oh, my God, what's happening, what's happening, and it's your job, so you kind of worry. I think it's better to kind of know, like, to have the idea at least where they plan on going with you or what they plan on having you do. I think that's way better than just kind of a big surprise. <laughs> now, last week we had on uh, a former... W, uh, WCW and ECW diva named Chastity. You might remember her. And yep. towards the end of the interview, I had this weird question that just popped in my head. And I thought it might be funny to ask you, too. Mm -hmm. How in the world does a normal person end up in the wrestling business? Um, <laughs> for, for me, uh, I was never like one of those. I, I'm sure she might have the same answer. Like, I don't know. It, I, I wasn't one of those people that were like, okay, when I grow up, I'm going to be a wrestler. Like, that wasn't me at all. Like, I always loved watching it, and I watched it ever since I was younger. My mom would bring me to, like, the Boston Garden to go see the matches and stuff. But for me, I was never, oh, that's going to be me in the ring, because I was never really a fighter or anything. Like, I was a peace person and type of thing. Um, what happened for me was uh, one of my friends was telling me how he wanted to be a wrestler, wanted to be a wrestler, and he was going to go to wrestling school. And I was absolutely shocked that there was such a thing as a wrestling school. I was like, you mean these guys don't actually just get in the ring and hate each other? Like, I'm really confused. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I went to Killer Kowalski's with him, and I actually sat and watched the majority of the classes for, like, three months. And I would videotape the classes for them and – so they could see what they needed to work on and stuff. And then um, a girl that was there training, April Hunter, she actually talked me into getting in the ring and trying it out myself. And once I did, I was I was in love, and I had never stopped. <laughs> Excellent. Why do you think April never – I know now she's having back problems and things like that, but why do you think she never really clicked? Because she had a heck of a lot of potential. Yeah, I'm I'm not quite sure with that. I, I, I don't understand why it never really happened. I know that she got a lot of opportunities and stuff, and I, I couldn't imagine why. She was really athletic, and she had the build and everything, so I, I, I could never really figure out what happened. So I know you're in the area, and I know that we've kind of, you know, teased the issue a little bit, but are you planning or hoping to, uh, to contact WWE and, and do something in the coming months? Um, I would love to work for WWE. Like, I, I think that every person that gets into wrestling, that's where they kind of aspire to go. Um, for me, I, I think I kind of just need to kind of have a little bit of a regroup and figure out exactly what's going on and 
kind of get over the whole being released thing first and then <laughs> see what's going on. Exactly, exactly. Well, uh, I'm not sure about these guys, but I'm going to finish up with one question and then I'm going to let them kind of uh, take us home here. Now, this mm-hmm. is kind of uh, our signature finish of the interview question because at this point, if you hang up on us, <laughs> we got most of it anyway. Uh, uh, that's kind of the yeah. way I look at it. Uh, there's never a good lead-in, is it? Um, it involves the name that we're supposed to not remember, and that is uh, Chris Benoit. Yeah. Okay. Now, you've been around the wrestling business for a long time, independence and on the TNA level, mm-hmm. and it bothers me as a fan to see the way that the media kind of jumped on it, and it made me think, you know, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I listen to these commentators all the time about politics, and I assume they know what they're talking about, but then I hear them talking about something that I actually know about, and they clearly don't have a damn clue, but they're presenting themselves as if they do. Mm-hmm. Um, from a wrestler's perspective, your perspective, what did you make of the Internet, not just the Internet, but the Fox News and MSNBC coverage of the Chris Benoit tragedy and the way that the media basically just made it seem like wrestlers are just a bunch of, you know, whatever they are? Um, I was actually kind of pissed off by it at first because for me, like, it's kind of like the movie that they have out right now, The Wrestler. Like, I think that a lot of people just see wrestlers in a bad light from it and they just generalize everybody into a group. Um, what people don't understand is wrestlers are like uh, professional wrestling is made up of a bunch of different people. It's not just one certain type of person. So if something like that happens, it's not like every wrestler is going to be the same way. Or if like somebody is caught and they have drugs on them or something, not every wrestler is that way. There are guys that are like that and there's girls that are like that, but not every person is going to have the same tendencies or the same hang-ups or anything like that. It's a, it's a group of completely different people that are just bound together by their work. Yeah, it's funny that you should say that because I was looking at my wife the other day and uh, we were talking about something and, and she said something to me like, why does it have to be this way? And I said, there's two reasons. I said, uh, first of all, we're talking about a business that's based on a lie. And mm-hmm. the second of all is um, it's just another day in wrestling high school. Because if you think about it, that's what it is. Everybody's got a different personality, and there's the same kind of dramas that there is when everybody's going through those you know, adolescent years. It just seems like, I don't know, it seems like saying that everybody is like Chris Benoit, or everybody is like, you know, there's, there was Bruiser Brody, but then there was also Lanny Poffo, and they're completely different people. You know? Exactly. Like, uh, if you just look at the knockout, like we were talking about, like, if you see somebody like ODD, and then you see somebody like Taylor Wilde, like, they're... They're different people, but they're going to get along, but they're bound together because of their work. Like, you know, like there's people in your office that are assholes, but it doesn't mean that you guys work in the same place that you're going to be an asshole, too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, uh, guys, you want to re- take her home? Oh, well, I have no more questions, but thank you so much for this interview. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Well, it's kind of fun to, like, clear up this whole thing that's going on. <laughs> Well, I mean, what do you think of this, the, the way that the Internet just, you know, oh, well, this is what happened. And, you know, uh, there was one story that, that you hit her and you made her drop to her knees and squeal in the ring and they cut that from the tape and all that. And, I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, there, there's some stuff where there's truth to some of the story and then there's people that grab it and they make a big, ginormous thing out of it. Like, um, I think that a lot of people just enjoy drama and that's a lot of the reason why people watch wrestling. Because wrestling is like a big, violent soap opera. So exactly. no matter what you see on TV, doesn't necessarily mean that the people are like that in the back. <laughs> exactly. What's exactly. the other thing? Uh, the, the story is always more interesting than the truth or something like that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Usually that's how it works out. Well, I'll, I'll close out with, uh, we started out with a little rock and roll, rock and roll uh, song there. And I'll close out with the same kind of adage that Gene Simmons always says. He says, you know, somebody said that Kiss stood for knights in Satan's service. And he says, I couldn't have written that if I tried. But hey, <laughs> people were talking about it, so exactly. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any publicity is publicity, so I'll take it, good or bad. <laughs> exactly. Well, Roxy, I wish you the best of luck. And where can people find out more about what you got coming up? Um, I actually have a website if people want to check it out. It's uh, Nikki-Rocks.org, or they can just reach me right on my MySpace, which is MySpace slash Wrestling Rock. Wrestling Rocks. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, uh, Roxy. We appreciate it. And we'll be looking out to 
see you coming up in the future, and if there's ever anything else we could do for you, just contact us, because we're always here, and uh, we'd be glad to help you promote anything you need. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. It was great meeting you. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay, you too. Okay, before I let you go, can I ask for one last thing? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't know I mean, how you're going to word this. If you want to call yourself Roxy, Nikki Rocks, or what have you, but do you mind giving us a liner, basically saying this is whoever you want to describe yourself as, and you're listening to the interactive interview? Sure. Uh, I think I can throw both names in there. Uh-huh. It is the interactive interview, yeah? The interactive interview, yep. Okay. We, got, we got a ton of different names, Wrestling Epicenter, whatever you want to call it. So. All right, let's get started and uh, get that done in five, four, three, two. Hi, this is Roxy or Nikki Rocks, and you're listening to the interactive interview. <laughs> 